Welcome to another episode of Getting to Know. Uh, this week, I'm delighted to announce that we've got Troy Townsend joining us. How's things going? Everything yeah, not too right? bad, thanks. Not too bad. Um, in the midst of a busy period, but uh, yeah, all things are good, to be fair, so I should never complain. Brilliant, brilliant. And we've got uh, my old friend, Steve Worrell. Steve, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm, re- I'm hoping to take a back seat today and not be the um, the main focus. The main focus needs to be Troy. That's you know we, it's very busy man. So to to manage to to get an hour of your, your time, Troy is a uh, an honour indeed. Um, and I'm hoping that we get really good conversation like you did when I last um, had a chance to chat to you. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, let's Fantastic. just hope when when the recording comes back that you're not the main focus again, Steve. Hey. <laughs> 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 Um, right, without any further ado, ado then, let's uh, let's get into it. So, Troy, we're going to go all the way back. Um, and my first question for you is, what are your first memories of football? Oh, when you said all the way back, you really meant all the way back, didn't you? Um, my first memories of football, uh, this is going to give away my age a little bit, I suppose. Um, the 1970 World Cup. Um, I wasn't allowed to watch much of it because it was on at uh, because it was in Mexico. It was on uh, at ungodly hours of the morning. And I was a mere pup at that time, but I was taken aback by this Brazilian team um, who, you know, every time I watch them play, they seem to do things on a football pitch that I never saw other teams do, to be totally honest. Um, and I was glued to this number 10, um, the famous number 10, Pelé. Um, like I said to you, I couldn't watch the whole games. I used to sneak down and try and watch some of them. Um, I got told off enough times, but I suppose it's my first football in memory was Brazil as a as a nation playing football and winning the World Cup. Um, and then trying to apply those skills like I would imagine everyone used to do, um, going out into the playground or the back garden, which wasn't very big, uh, my back garden. I lost many a football that I didn't really have. Um, to be able to try and execute those skills. So, yeah, Brazil were my first memory. Um, and I, I suppose just exposed me to how I was, wanted to develop and play as a as a young player. Um, yeah, and uh, the delights of watching them and seeing them lift the trophy, I just wanted to emulate that, you know, that World Cup trophy, that gold trophy, something that I wanted to hold and emulate um, throughout my career. So, yeah, that would be my first memory. And uh, just just kicking around the ball in the house and getting told off all the time would be would be the next, I suppose. Brilliant. And just going on from from the World Cup, did did the World Cup inspire you then to take up playing football outside? Like, yeah. I mean, like grassroots wise? Well, not yet. I mean, I was still young. I'm not going to give them away my age, but I was still young. Um, and I suppose just what it did is own that I loved the sport, you know, and I think um, I kind of wanted to just emulate the players on the field of play. So I very quickly became used to their names, Jerson, Revelino, um, Pele, you know, just the Carlos Alberto, just the quality um, of the players that they had. Um, and I suppose it then kind of identified that it was a support, a, a sport that I was falling in love with, even at such a young age. You know, it's there was nothing else on my mind. You know, my first football um, would just have been one of those very light footballs that I used to smash against the wall and probably had to run down the road, half the way down the road to go and collect it. But it just formulated my thought process, I think. And it's a very long time ago, but formulated my pro- thought process that this sport was going to, be a part of me forever in a day you know and eventually when I was you know playing grassroots football or playing for my school team a lot of or in the playground a lot of the memories were around the Brazilian World Cup and for some reason and I don't know why this is I started to attract myself to this North London club Tottenham Hotspur and and so their players became really prominent in the way that I wanted to play at that period of time as well. Bless you, bless you. That must have been a, a stressful period. <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably still is. <laughs> I, I mean, didn't know I mean, there were jokes on this platform as well. I mean, you never told me that. I mean, I've, I've got to be See, careful because I've outnumbered two to one here. Um, <laughs> well, you are. And I mean, it, it, it. obviously it shows how young you are. I mean, I, I'm not going to give away my age, but 
I wasn't born in 70, <laughs> Troy, <laughs> but um, <laughs> in, in that in that period Tottenham weren't actually a bad side so although we did have a, a bit of a downturn but we weren't actually a bad side uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's just way before your time so you just wouldn't know you just remember all the like you know <laughs> bit of a history lesson for all me the... though yeah very <laughs> much so very much so brilliant um I just want to I want to stick around the theme of, of you know when you were when you were young and you're talking about the influence of, of football um you know knowing that football was going to have an influence on your life um would you mind just sharing a little bit around what your upbringing was like, or, you know, more so around where you grew up and just bits around that and how you how you feel your upbringing has shaped you as a person that you are today? Yeah, I was born in Hackney, um, the mother's hospital, which is no longer here. But if you talk to people of my era, uh, they'll tell you that they were also born in the same hospital, which was brilliant. Um, I spent my first few years in Hackney, um, you know, born to um, parents from the Windrush generation um, and uh, an elder brother, uh, Mark. Uh, we didn't spend long in, in Hackney. Uh, we moved to Walthamstow uh, probably when I was about three years of age, I think, um, to a road called Downsfield Road, which is uh, anyone that knows the Walthamstow area and, and knows Kelmscott uh, Leisure Centre, which was a school. They'll know where that is. But at the end of my road was a um, <laughs> was a lighthouse and that was where the church was. Um, and that's where my mum used to drag me every Sunday morning to go to to, to Sunday school. Um, and I shouldn't say drag, but it was dragged. Um, and also I, I saw it as the thing that also denied me from starting playing football at a lot earlier age, to be totally honest, because, you know, we had to to put on our Sunday best and go down the road and 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 kind of you know do the routine as such as Sunday school um my my family background my father wasn't around long so I, I haven't really got to connect with my father and, and my brother was four or five years older than me but he'd all he could also play a bit as well so my memories of of my childhood are not of a, a real secure family environment but of someone who um kind of used to run free a little bit as such um my road was a I'm lucky that some of the friends that I grew up with and became friends, um, they were also, you know, living either down the left road a bit, across the road a bit. And and they used to be the people that, um, you know, I used to play football with back in the days, that big wall that you used to have, you know, house at the end of the road. And you just, you know, you, you, you put a couple of tops down and you form a goal and you create your own space when children, it was a lot safer for children to play out, you know, in, in front of their houses or behind the houses as well. But we used to play football. We used to play cricket and they were just my friendship circle. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the memories of, of my home life and the memories of, of, of growing up are, are very faint. Unfortunately, um, I used to go to a school called most of my schools are no longer there anymore. So this is why it's all used to go to a primary school called Mark House. Um, I had the privilege, we moved to a new school called Southgrove and I spent a year at Southgrove Primary School and I had the privilege of being the person that cut the ribbon ribbon for the new school. So there's a little bit of a claim to fame uh, with the local oh. councillor. Um, and I remember that I had my favourite shirt it was a Superman shirt. I used to have Superman dotted all over this shirt. It was my favourite shirt, by the way. And it's one that got the picture that was taken was in the local Guardian as well. So my favourite shirt, me cutting a ribbon for the school that I was uh, that I was attending. Um, and the reason why I mentioned the school, because it was the I captained the school team. And it's the first time I won a medal in our last year of uh, primary school. Um, and this is the influence of Brazil. So when the, the school teacher was saying, look, we need to get a kit and da 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 and whatever, I I begged him to get a kit that had yellow shirts sky blue shorts and white socks um, and I begged him to wear the number 10 shirt as well and I got it all um, I was a captain of the team you know I lifted the shield it wasn't a trophy back then I lifted the, the winner's shield then it was my like I said it was it was the thing that ultimately I became a winner in the game and uh, I loved it I, I loved all the adulation of being one of the best players in the team um, I was a captain of the team. It helped me gain prominence within my school environment because football, you know, is the sport. And I think it was the thing that enabled me to to be the person to cut the ribbon in the school as well. So your credibility as a footballer, a young footballer goes up massively. So credibility within your school environment amongst your friends 
and I loved all that. I've got to be honest. I love. I milked it to the very hilt. So um, yeah, that was like early memories of of home life, uh, school life, and, and winning my first medal. It's interesting because, like like you, I think you know at school, you know, I I I was quite good at football, and and I didn't I I haven't really thought back about it at all. I do know I'm, I always remember like you know playing and always being one of the first people to be picked and all that sort of stuff and you but actually in ter- didn't really give it a lot of thought but you're right in terms of the the standing and the kudos that you got within the school like this so this was both schools like primary school and secondary mm. school that you that you got just because of your, on the basis yeah. of your ability to play football is amazing I didn't even I haven't until you mentioned it I've not fully reflected back on on that and 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 as you say the you know how it stood you in in you know in that in that yeah. environment isn't yeah it's in, it's the only difference it's between me and you Steve is that I was always picking the teams because my teams had to win I wasn't a very good loser <laughs> so in the school playground you know it was me I had the ball no one could get the ball off me I had it under my arm and then I chose the next captain and I was always first pick and <laughs> uh, no see I and from from my I mean for my self esteem I didn't I didn't want to although they they'd asked me to be the captain I didn't want to be the captain because I wanted to be the first person to be picked mm. so you get two other captains and then they go right well and then they'd be like I want Steve so <laughs> then that you've got people that want you rather than you go right you know and then after that then you start to influence the rest of the team yeah, and yeah, lo yeah, and behold yeah. you know some poor someone was the you know the last person to be picked and if you look if you think back on it now it's terrible it's a terrible it was terrible, terrible yeah terrible it, it was terrible it's always the same person that was last fortunately i wasn't in that situation but obviously when you then grow up and realize oh, i've been a school teacher as well realize that you know how that plays out as well being the last or knowing that you're not good enough to sit on any team but you're going to be the last person to be picked and that probably means that actually no team wants you and the impact of that as well can be obviously quite severe as such on, on young people so um, yeah, I, I fully understand that. I fully get that. Brilliant. Um, you're, uh, yeah, I, I, again, you're making me feel left out because I'm absolutely pants at football. So what's this? What is this? Have you two like ganged off on me on purpose? Because you're all naming things that you know I've got nothing to do with. Um, but no, that's brilliant. Um, I, I, can we move on to your um, your playing career then, Troy, and, and how that planned out and what the journey was like through that? Uh, yeah, um, it's a bit of an emotional one in the end. But the, like I said to you, I, I was quite a bright young child, um, very good at mathematics, very good in uh, the classroom as such. Um, but I used to ignore that because I always felt that this this football journey, whatever it may have been, was going to be the one that would bring me to have a successful career, a successful life. Um I remember joining, so finally getting away from Sunday score. I remember a a coach uh, coming to see me play for the score and just saying, I want you to play for my Sunday team. That Sunday team was called Anaconda, the weirdest name out of of whatever. But yeah, I remember it like it's it's, it's my first team that I officially played for outside the school environment. And uh, a lot of my school friends, my my centre forward partner, my uh, left sided player, my right back, were all playing for Anaconda. And obviously they were egging me on to come. But the big stumbling block was my mum. So finally saying to mum, you know, I I love Sunday school, but um, and it was one time when I packed my bag before Sunday school. So I didn't have my my nice jacket on. And mum said to me, where are you going? And I kind of I was nervously and I kind of said, I'm going to football, mum, because this person says I can play really well. Um, I can't tell you the rest of that story because it didn't end well for me, (laughs) apart from the fact that I did go and play football. And it was good to be noted for your talent and ability outside of your circle of friends almost and outside your school environment. And I excelled. Um, You know, the journey took me to uh, being noticed. So at 12, 13, I'm starting to be noticed. I'm not quite sure notice for what but there were clubs interested and my family were not invested in their football career so um i kind of had to take that on board by myself and my sunday league manager whose name was mac was almost my parental support in the football sphere do you know what i mean he was the one that used to feel if any scout came and said we like the 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 number nine or number 11 or 10 whatever number i was playing at the time 
Um, and uh, I'm, it, there was a club called Beaumont Football Club and I never wanted to leave Anaconda because it was such a safe space and, and Mac, who used to work around the corner from where I lived, was was almost taking on the role, like I just said, as, as that parental figure that would guide me through my, my kind of career. But Beaumont were a big team in Waltham Forest. Um, Teddy Sheringham, Martin Hayes, Jimmy Carter. Amrit is probably going way over your head, half of them, but Steve will know them. And Michael Jilks, um, Perry Suckling as a goalkeeper. They were a side and a half. And if I wanted to be the best, then it was almost you've got to join that team. At the time, one of my one of the most flair players that I'd ever witnessed on a TV screen, Vince Allaire, um, had just uh, I'd joined Crystal Palace from Beaumont. So uh, my kind of journey was made where Mac agreed to let Beaumont have me. And I remember uh, the manager, Brian Shirt and his son used to play and they just said, come and play for us. And there's an option to go and play for Millwall as well. Um, and I remember my Millwall debut like... Oh, like it was yesterday as a 4-2 win against Aston Villa. Um, I'm having an absolute storm, stormer. I've scored one, but I don't remember the goal. But I remember the, the opportunity I created from bursting from the halfway line. Um, in on goal, 18 yards out and hitting, probably striking the ball as sweet as I've ever struck a ball in my life. Um, turning away, thinking it's gone in and then hearing the clatter of the crossbar and the ball bouncing out <laughs> way past the 18-yard box. Um, but I remember the roar from the touchline and on the touchline were scouts. Um, on the touchline was obviously many people invested in the fixture and, and it was my first real introduction. Coming off the pitch, that adulation then came from people who I didn't know. So I was getting pats on the back. I was getting told that I was one of the best players that they'd ever seen. My manager was over the moon um, because obviously he's getting credibility because he's bringing all these players from Beaumont into the mill environment. And I suppose I got carried away. Uh, I felt that I'd made it. Uh, I remember going back into school the following day. Can't wait to tell my friends. I've told one of my friends to tell the head teacher. So he called me out in assembly um, and all those kind of things, you know. And uh, yeah, I think I did get carried away. It was it was nice to feel wanted. I remember I came from a family environment where, you know, I was the youngest child. My father's absent. Me and my brother were okay, but not great. And my mum wasn't invested in football. So, yeah, I, I, I loved the kind of noise around my name. Um, but eventually, because I didn't have that kind of support that is required at that level, I, I fiddled out of Millwall. It's not like the system now, but I fiddled out because if Matt couldn't take me to training or well, I couldn't... I, I was nervous to ask people to take me to training. It was in South East London. I lived in Waltham Forest. Um, I wasn't good at bunking trains or stuff, you know, getting on buses and running away from the conductor. I didn't do all that. I was scared of that. So I missed sessions and ultimately got released. And I say released, you kind of say, well, look, it's not going to work for him here, you know. Um, for me, that is being released. But again, I got taken to Crystal Palace after that. And I went to Palace for six months and trained. And uh, the coach was was John Cartwright, who was the former England under-21 manager as well. Um, and I've got to admit, I learned more in six months under John than what I had under anybody, just because I, I just seemed to take to the, what his style of coaching. But he wasn't a decision maker. And they said that they had a forward that was better than me and I wasn't going to move them out of the environment. And that was almost the end of the journey as a 15-year-old. Because like I said, I didn't have support. I didn't have guidance. I didn't have anyone kind of picking me up and saying, dusting me down and saying, there's another 90 clubs out there. If you're good enough, you know, you'll be good enough somewhere. And and I fell out of the game. And I'll mention this. I kind of went rogue in my life almost, you know, from the last year or so at school, um, which became non-existent. I turned up when I wanted to turn up. I didn't turn up. I didn't have to turn up. Um, I even went into sixth form. I don't know why I went into sixth form, but there was a bar football game in the in the games room. And so I wanted to be the best at bar football. I wasn't interested in the in the lessons. I was interested in being the best at bar football. And to the end, my, my school life just fiddled out. I had no one in control of me, like I said. So my football career kind of vanished. Um, and I just went in to play with groups of friends because I just wanted to enjoy myself. I wanted to feel that value of being wanted again. And 
I, I, you know, I, I dipped out an academy and gone straight into grassroots football and there's no level at grassroots football. It's just grassroots. Um, I remember a day that someone said that an Arsenal scout was around. I don't know if they were there to watch me or not. Um, I didn't have the best of games. That's the end of the story. And I just continued playing grassroots after that all the way through. Uh, that's a, that's a really, really... Pa- Go on, Steve. Sorry. Sorry, I'm real. It's, in, oh, it's interesting. I, I just that, I mean, I, I'm assuming Amrit might touch on this or about to touch on this, but the the influence of, uh, you know, having that support around you and that, you know, someone to guide you um, and, and how important that was, because I, I grew up in a similar, similar sort of environment to you. My mum was a church goer. My dad wasn't around. My brother was only a couple of years older, but actually we didn't really get on a lot. Um, and but in terms of that football you know I was driven I was you know like you I was quite bright but I was I was driven towards wanting to achieve something at football but the school weren't as you know weren't as supportive I think or you know didn't have that sort of set up in the same way I think that helped you to get to where you were initially at that point so you know a lot of that I had to do for myself so I you know I approached I was brought up in South East London, so I approached a lot of clubs around South East London and said, well, you need to, um, you know, contact, you need to so be playing for the school or you need to be playing at non-league. So, I, you know, I wrote to Millwall, all, all those sort of clubs and everyone in the South and even down as far as Brighton and all of those sort of clubs. Um, and they said, well, you need to be either playing non-league or you need to play uh, for the school. Um, you know, and I found lots of barriers in terms of, you know, not being able to get to certain places. So, like, you know, I like you, like, you know, I, I had to sort of make my way by bus or anything like that. Yeah. And, like, went to a couple of his sessions and if I got into in one session, then that was it. I didn't didn't have anyone to say, no, just stick yeah. with it. You know, they, they're they still interested. Stick with it. Once you finish, once you've recovered from your injury, go back and see how it is. I said, well, I'm injured. That's my time. That's my opportunity mm-hmm. done. So I think that having that... um that role model or that guidance or someone yeah. there to just steer you is so so important in terms of how it, it you know it can shape or structure you in that period you know and as you say you kind of for a, a while when like when it was quite key probably in, in terms of being someone just being able to support and say look you know there's still opportunities or or you know there's still there's still things out there as you say there's still a number of other clubs there um would have been key to helping you to make a better decision. Just that that support wasn't there for you at that time. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, there was. Uh, I remember um, I walked out at Wembley. Um, I was part of the district squad. That um, there was an opportunity for all the boroughs in London to go and uh, perform in front of the Queen at of the 1980 Cup final. Um, and if there was a quiz question here, I'd ask you to who played in the 1980 Cup final. Um, I'll give Steve 10 seconds. It looks like he doesn't know. It's, so, it's, um, Is it not West Ham and um, Arsenal? I'm going to take everything back. You are absolutely correct. Who scored the winning goal? It was um, the guy with the curly hair. Sun, Alan Sunderland, is it? OK, so I'll take away some points now. Um, it was Trevor Brookin. It was Trevor Brookin. OK. Um, okay. But I remember being, you know, walking out when we went on the Thursday night. We, we performed whatever we were going to do on the pitch on Thursday. And you know that just this was the old Wembley. So when you walk out behind the goal, yeah. I imagine myself as an international footballer. Mm. You know, I imagine walking out onto that pitch. My boots on that day were pristine, by the way, because I didn't want Wembley to see any mud from Troy Towns in the boot. So... They were pristine. And when you walk out there and you feel the lush surface, it's nothing that I'd ever been on before. So, again, I got really kind of hooked up in the fact that the dream was coming alive, you know. And I don't know, we were we trained for about an hour on the Thursday. We go back and we perform, you know, half an hour before the cup final. The teams are, are just coming out as well. So I'm walking past professional footballers. And then we get to go and, and watch the game, although we were at the back of the stand. So I don't think I saw anything until Trevor Brookings scored, by the way, but managed to see that. But it's those kind of things that you, an opportunity is provided. You then start to live the dream. I'm imagining I'm playing in that cup final. You know, so mm. when the spiral came, 
it came because my dreams were at their highest point. They were right up there and, and, and there was no middle ground almost. And, and very much like you, Steve, you know, my brother's four years older than me. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to dip too strong into my family life, but I just don't think that we were, with a, even with a supported brother, supported brother, I may have been able to, you know, pick myself back up again and drive on to something else. But it, it, I don't want to blame anyone here. I, I know I had the talent. I know I had the ability without doubt but you know these things are, are meant to test us aren't they absolutely I, I, that's really powerful especially around um like steve i'm really glad you touched upon that steve around the influence of someone like was it mac sorry you called him yeah mac yeah yeah like someone like that just really powerful i'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here um troy <laughs> but i, I, I want to see your thoughts on this because you've obviously got a, a lot more experience um than i have in, in this area in regards to Going through, you know, like the systems, like, so, you know, your academies for the girls, you've got the RTCs, the ACCs, etc. Do you feel that there's an element that they are designed for one type of person, not player, person in regards to, you know, you've got to be able to have family support here. You've got to be able to get training here. You've got to be able to get matches here. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a great question, by the way. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I've literally just uh, completed a documentary around the Academy system, an audio documentary that's got had its first airing on TalkSport last week. And it's a three part audio that will end up with a live show. And I, I'm aware of the Academy structure because of my son, who's been through a system, etc. My son, sorry, who have been through a system and there's been positives and negatives around that. But I don't think any system in football can have a one size fits all because we're all different and we all need a, a, a different way of, of development. You know, we all need a structure that supports us and what who we are. And I'm not saying this is football's fault in any way, but I don't think it's there at the moment. I, I just believe that the journeys and pathways are all going to have go off in a slight tangent and I've I believe, to be honest with you, football needs to review its system um, and how it enables people to flourish within the environment and how it allows young people, remember, and their family members to appreciate the enormity of what they're going through. Because I don't think a lot of people understand the enormity of taking your child and they are children. I keep saying child because, you know, you can go into obviously we read the reports the other day of, of of a child going in or being signed at five years of age and for me that's absolutely scandalous by the way um and i wouldn't i i don't know what's in place that a club cannot do that rather than do that but there's a pressure point of, of families so you know we're now living in a social media era and the more you can get your son's profile boosted um your daughter's profile boosted i think it's more in the in the in the boys and men's game to be totally honest you know the more you'll have access to opportunity or the more you'll have access to sponsorships or you know endorsements and that's not what the game should be about the game should be about first of all homing your talent and ability because no one is ever a professional footballer at seven eight nine ten eleven whatever years of age you're only ever a professional footballer when you finally sign on the dotted line and by the way, the career has so many different ups and downs that, you know, you're going to have to navigate a journey and you're going to have to navigate that journey as a family as well. And if your family invested at a faster pace than your development is, then that creates a whole issue anyway, because their expectation is that you should be somewhere down the line whilst your talent and ability is still developing at the rate that it needs to, you know. Um, and unfortunately, I've heard far too many stories like that of the parent superseding the player talent almost you know because of a belief that you know little i don't want to call no names my son or my daughter is going to be the next big thing so i think there needs to be a whole review around that and the whole review around the process of bringing young players into the environment bringing their parents into the environment and talking about expectations um you know one of the most things that i heard in my journey was has everyone ever thought that the players are actually having a career before their career? So, you know, they're in a system, at, let's say at seven, that means that a lot of their school life is, is cut short because, uh, you know, you have to get home, you have to get into the car, you have to get to training, 
you can't walk, wait around and interact with your school friends. They may be going off to do other things. You're in the car. You're doing your homework while you're in your car. You've got a sandwich in one hand, a pen in the other. And you've got to focus on the fact that you're going to have to go out and, and, and perform at the best of your ability in training sessions for the best part of an hour before you then do the journey home and maybe finish the homework as well. You know, and if you're doing that three times a week, what's your social life looking like? And some people will say, well, why do young people need a social life? Well, they need it so they can develop as human beings. You know, they need to be able to interact with people outside of their own circle or outside of their football circle. So just they develop. And I think football takes that away, if you want me to be totally honest. It, it takes it away in an academy environment and it becomes you become a professional before you're a professional because you're doing all the things that a professional would do, but you're still in the educational environment. And, you know, the sacrifices that are made from from parents and guardians as well. So I, I don't know how football does it. And I know football is looking at trying to, to, to look at what it's achieving in this space, but it is a difficult one. And I think parents need to be sat down at the very outset and young players have to be sat down and understood the commitment behind trying to make it as you know to the stage where you could be a professional footballer at 17 years of age or you could be running out for your debut at that age with with you know senior players um don't get me started because i'll keep you talking all night long on this one but yeah i, I do believe that then there needs to be a, a moderation of what it looks like and maybe even if it's like entry levels are later you know rather than earlier um, i mean so would you, uh, do you think that's uh, do you think that's a reality though? Because no, you know, as you say, from a, from a football club, there's a race to the like from football clubs, there's a race to the the bottom in terms of trying to recruit earlier and earlier. And also, you're always going to get uh, you know parents and you know the kids that are will see the offer as an opportunity. You know to you know like we did when we were younger, we thought we were going to you know you want that opportunity to, to you know to 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 make it big and so yeah but steve, any, steve any parent any player that's offered that is going to want to jump in so yeah but steve there has to be a certain amount of reality posted to it as well you know so i don't yeah, we didn't live in a social media world so whatever noise was about me was in a within a small circle of people that kind of knew my talent and wanted to progress yeah. that talent now you can have somebody league clubs posting that their young talent are signed for one of the major football clubs at eight years of age and they're promoting it. And look, there's another one on the gravy train. I don't believe in things like that. Yeah. I don't believe, you know, because at eight yeah. years of age, you've not made it. You've just signed to commit yourself for a season to whatever football club that is. You know, I had a yeah, young yeah, player yeah. at my football club who was probably one of my most talented when uh, I was coaching and he was only nine and Arsenal came in and took him from me. And I'm, and I'm saying they took him from me. They didn't ask, they took him. His whole family was an Arsenal uh, supporting family. So as far as he's concerned, he's gone to the club of his dreams. They were giving yeah. him expenses to get on a bus because his mum didn't drive. So he thought he was getting paid. Uh, do you know what I mean? Mm. So all of that, a year later, he's dumped. He's dumped. Yeah. And he comes back into my environment, not the player that he was that he left. And I've got a whole rebuilding process for this young lad whose confidence is shot. Mm. Now, for me... There should have been a process of Arsenal still connecting with him. And I'm using Arsenal here, but I could use many a club still connecting with him to make sure that, you know, he he regarded himself as a failure. It's something that I regarded myself and I didn't make it. But actually what it was, he was not good enough for Arsenal Football Club, but he could have been good enough for another club. But I wanted him to come back into my environment and get that self-esteem and confidence back up, you know, and, and maybe not even worry about academies for two, three years. Um, mm. But I think, like we've mentioned, even the parents get carried away with it all a bit, don't they? Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't think it's going to change, if you want me to be totally honest, but it doesn't stop us talking about it, does it? And it doesn't stop us from wanting to, to get the change that we believe should happen. No, I think you're totally right. You know, and I, 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 I it's interesting that you mentioned that young. It, it was I thought it was, you know, it's sad that it was on, you know, that. The, the the dad and and as you say this is you know i don't know how much of this is down to the the parents as well but the dad has got him on bbc breakfast and they're you know they're talking about this this young lad and i don't know if you saw i don't know if you saw the the the, uh, the clip on on bbc breakfast but they 
they interview him and, and then they show an interview where the young the boy as I say he's five and they're asking you know they're asking a five-year-old questions which is hard enough for them to answer but this young lad is is now because they think he's so good or such a, a talent he's now playing up against seven that young lad um that's you know five um and I asked him what how do you think about that and he said well it's difficult you know so and and the beauty uh, that that just just that little sentence tells you told me that my initial perception of this was correct you know that I thought it was wrong and the poor lad he's going well like, it's, it's difficult you know what I mean these boys are probably towering above him and they put him in this environment and go well you know he's a very good lad so he'll, he'll either sink or he'll you know he'll either sink or he'll swim and he's going well you know I'm in there but it's difficult and he's five you know uh, well, yeah, I don't listen, know. for me, it's for me, it's crazy. I, I don't want to parent anyone else's child. You know what I mean? So if they believe that's the best route to go down, then they believe it. But for me, oof, nah, not knowing the game that the way that I do, unfortunately. Saying, um, you know, you mentioned around around the land that you had um, that branded himself as a failure, and then you know, you said when you dropped out, you felt like a failure. Isn't that just almost setting him up to fail? I mean, you know, it's brilliant to have such an extraordinary talent. At, you know, whatever you might be, four, five, whatever. But the harsh reality of that is that, you know, whether it's con- like, however conscious it is now, but definitely subconsciously, as he's growing up, he's going to be, you know, regarded as this and his family will be talking about this. And, you know, he's going to school and he's getting recognised at like six or seven. Um, you know, when it comes to that then later on, when, OK, you know, I, I, I don't know what his journey looks like because no one's seen it yet. But if he does come to be released, how is that going to impact him? Like, I mean, it's bad enough, like you said, we've got grassroots people that are, you know, it's devastating for them. You think about him, he's literally going to be falling off Mount Everest if he goes straight out of the thing and he's... You know, some people will say to us on the other side, what if he doesn't ever get released? What if he does make it the whole way through the system? What if he is, at, at that period of time, the next big thing? You know, and and and, has, and then they can track back to when he was four or five years old and signed for Arsenal with Per Mertesacker next to him. That's always going to be the other side of it. What I'm saying is it's not for me. It's not, uh, you know, I would find it very hard to endorse or advise any parent in that way that that's the right thing to do. You know, I would find it very hard to to post continued clips on Instagram or your other social media platforms as your child is just developing and enjoying i know it looks good because that's the era that we're in but when do they when does that stop and then what are the questions you know behind oh i haven't seen them post for about six months now what's 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 happened there you know and it's because maybe there is a a downturn in form or there's an injury or or there's a release process and so i just think i think you said it there Emmett. is is what are we setting them up to fail and i think sometimes we are there's going to be a very small percentage that navigate all the way through and are able to then, you know, run out on a professional football pitch and say, look, mum and dad, you know, brother and sister, auntie and uncle, whatever it may be, I've made it. And the journey is thanks to everything that we've created. The one thing I would say is I don't think any young person can do this without the love and support of their their parents and their loved ones. This is not a journey where you can just navigate it alone. You have to have those people and those right people um around you to be able to navigate all the pitfalls that will be presented in front of you at some stage because they will definitely and i think you, you talk uh, from a lot of go on steve no no carry on because i think you're about to go in the same direction i will say it's cool so i just want to then bring it to more so um so you've obviously you know you've gone through it yourself what was it like then having your son go through that how did you find the whole journey well the one thing the massive difference around my son going through the journey is the fact that he had the support systems around him he had the guidance systems around him uh maybe went in a little bit too early taken aback by it all and you know but ultimately he we were there as a family find himself enjoy himself again and play with a smile on his face the problem was, is that Ridgeway had so many talented young players at that stage that they were all being picked. So all of a sudden, you either go back to a club that's, you know, deprived of all its talent and assets, or, or you then look to maybe 
you know, again, see if you can get back into the environment. And we were very fortunate that not long afterwards that Tottenham came in. Um, and again, you know, every training session, not always well, more, I miss my partner, to be totally honest, more than anything else, because I was now a coach and, and doing things elsewhere and also had my, my eldest son who was was playing as well and I was a manager of his team so it was making sure we were at every session no matter where they were so you've got one over there you've got one over there you've got to split your, yourself and you know coming off of the training ground and you know just having the things that are, that are absolutely required to 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 help you along the way you know and, and when difficult conversations come up the difficult conversations are not being had with your son as such, but they're being had with a parental figure. Um, and that happened with us. We had difficult conversations when he got to, I think it was under 14s, he was playing up a year and the academy manager at the time didn't believe that he had the desire to make it as a professional footballer. You know, so every game he kicks a ball in professional game now, which is 200 and, I don't know, 70, 80, brings a smile to my face back to that time when, you know, the academy manager said, I don't think he's got the desire to make it as a professional footballer. And also to Arsenal for saying he's not going to be tall enough to play professional football, you know. So there will always be doubters along the way, by the way. But if you're a close knit unit, if you're a family that that takes, I'm not saying that families don't, but obviously takes pride in the journey and make sure that there are no conversations happening without you part of that. Then, uh, you know, you're almost protecting your son in a way. And then when they're old enough and they spread their wings, so they go into the scholarship in, environment and it is employment. They're on their own. You can't hold their hand in there. And, you you know, as, as long as you know that they're happy and safe. One of the things we said that, that we didn't want him going into uh, a house parent. We wanted him to stay at home. So to continue to have home comforts um, while still developing as a young man. Um, and, you know, the, the occasion that he was going on national trips or whatever else, they were going to be his experiences of being away until away from home and not sleeping in his bed until the time that he you know, it was it was natural for that transition. So the biggest difference was the fact that uh, the whole journey has been not designed by us, but we've been a part of the whole journey. Do you think, Troy, with, with obviously with your son's um, journey and the support that you that you had, that you were able to provide for him, do you think that you were able to reflect back on some of your own experiences to ensure that the environment that you created for him helped you know to deal with those disappointments that he'd had along the way um and ensuring that you know that there was still there would still be another opportunity in the you know in the future like you know you said that under 14 as well you know he had challenges then and you can look back on that now and think you know great you know that's a you know that's a vindication for you know persistence and proof that actually that 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 academy person was wrong but ultimately that was you know because you you know because you went through those experiences that you did yourself that you were able to then think okay you know it, it's, it's still there for you do you know what you've got to remember the period of time that i had my experiences which the academy set up an environment was totally different back then to mm -hmm. when my son was growing in the environment I, so it's very hard to compare, although, yeah, you, you maybe not speak about your experiences, but then learn from them and then subtly introduce them into a different way of, of thinking. The, the Tottenham experience, just going around that Tottenham experience and the academy manager um, saying that he didn't think he had the desire to make it as a professional footballer. We made sure that we did things outside the academy environment that I don't think Spurs were happy about, but we wanted a, a better all round holistic approach to his development. Um, and that included anyone knows the, the Cobra experience. So Friday nights going to Cobra and working on his, his footwork, foot manipulation of the ball. And that is what Cobra was all about. Um, and also joining Paul Elliott, the, the former Chelsea Celtic defender. He used to run an academy. And at that academy, they only focused on the positives. They only focused on the positives of, of, his, of his, his, his development and enhancing the positives. And that doesn't always happen in an academy. So the day after that conversation at Spurs, he had a game that night for Paul Elliott's academy. Um, and they were playing Charlton. I remember a certain John Joe Shelby on the pitch for Charlton as well. Um, and listen, Paul Elliott's academy lost 8-3. 
but the three goals were scored by Andros. Um, and it kind of proved on that night that he's not going to ne- let the negative conversation that happened the night before affect what he wanted to do and wanted to achieve on the football field. And his goals were all different. One was a free kick, one was a, a, a lung bursting run, and one was a, a, a nice, cute bit of play of getting in front of the defender. And so the next day that we were in Spurs and, and there was these rumours that he was leaving um, was a, was a particular experience that we kind of said, well, you know, what? if Spurs don't want you, other clubs will. I never had that conversation. No one had yeah. that conversation with me. Yeah. And I think that's the massive difference in regards to uh, development. And then, do you know what? The academy manager got sacked almost at the same time. So maybe he knew what was happening. Chris Ramsey, John McDermott, uh, eventually Alex Inglethorpe, they all come into the environment and then all of a sudden his career excels. So there is a stroke of luck in it as well, because I think if the academy manager had stayed, he wouldn't have stayed at Spurs. But luckily, yeah. he left. New cohort came in. They looked at his talent. That will do for us. Bam, he's flying. Football is all about luck as well. We have to remember that. Making this in, in this game is also, there's an element of luck that goes alongside your talent, your ability, your support system, your guidance system, and the extracurricular stuff that you do as well. Absolutely. And I think uh, I think flying's a bit of an understatement at the moment because he's <laughs> absolutely tearing it up. Um, and I still I still remember watching him uh, walk out and play for my beloved Queen's Park Rangers. Ah. Um, and that uh, that amazing volley he scored against Sunderland. I was Sunderland, sat in the loft that yeah. day. Yeah, oh, still amazing. Uh, amazing. So we've actually met, but we just didn't know we'd met and Rich, yeah, because I was yeah. there every single game. Uh, yeah, that he played, but... I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Sure that was the experience Stop. that made him a professional footballer because, or sorry, a Premier League player because Harry Redknapp believed in him, played him in the Premier League at a club that was struggling. You wouldn't mind admitting that. And it proved that he could play at that level and, and he went back. And then, to be fair, 10 months later, he's, he's walking out of Wembley making his England debut. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I, mean, I, don't, I mean, I don't I don't really want to, I don't want to dwell on Andros too much, Troy, because obviously this is more about, about you and your journey. But... As as Amrit said, I mean he's absolutely flying at, um, at Everton now, and I mean as as a as a dad, <laughs> it must be it must be difficult to to see you know the situation, for example, where he, where he was at, at at Palace and he's in and out of the side, um, but then you know because he he he's, he goes to Everton and like he's he's rejuvenated and he. You know, he looks every bit the player that he looked when he was flying at Spurs. And, and you'd think, you know, me, personally, I'm really pleased for him, you know, mm. as a just as a as a player, may, maybe because I know you as well. But but mm. as a player, you know, and how much he, you know, he gave to Spurs and, and how much committed he was and everything. And I'm, I'm pleased for him. But I just don't understand how, you know, you can have that 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 massive difference, and just that it's clear that that belief and from from uh, Benitez, you know, is, is yeah. helping to, you know, yeah. to to for him to flourish again. Well, it's interesting because obviously he had Rafa Benitez at Newcastle for I think it was eight nine games, and under Rafa, his record and his performances were exactly the same as what you're seeing now. Um, you know, he wanted to move because Newcastle went down, and he wanted to stay in the Premier League. His opening experience with Alan Pardew at Palace wasn't great, but when Sam Allardyce took over again, Palace saw the true Andros Townsend. Um, mm-hmm. Frank De Boer experience wasn't great, but he didn't last long. And then Roy came in. You know, he, he played in some exceptional Crystal Palace sides who were, uh, you know, I would always say punching above their weight. But if you look at their record against the so-called top six, um, Palace were a dangerous, dangerous counter-attacking team. And Andros contributed mm-hmm. in so many ways with some stunning goals during that period of time as well. I think the last year and a bit, he'd suffered a little bit through some niggly injuries that affected his performances and Palace's style of play. There's no doubt yeah. in that, that the style of play didn't suit him as an individual to bring out the best in him that Rafa is doing now. So again, when you're in a, a system and an environment, sometimes it suits you, sometimes it doesn't. He had to learn the ugly side of the game. And for him, that's a defensive part of it. Um, and kind of almost Roy moulded him into that rather than see him express himself in and around the 18-yard box, you know. So 
it is one of those things. He's got a manager that trusts him, knows him, knows what he's going to get from him, still wants to push the limits on him. And he absolutely loves it and has, has kind of shown that there's more in the tank yet. And he's proven that a, a very, very big football club. Absolutely. Fair play to him. We wish him all the best uh, going forward. Thank you. Um, just uh, j- just carrying on with, with your story around, you know, you've obviously touched upon and you've gone into detail with your playing. Talk to me around the coaching side. Oh, well, I thought he was never going to touch the coaching side. I thought it was a failure at coaching. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> coaching brought my love back for the game. So when things were all doom and gloom around football playing and just realising that I wasn't going to make it. One of the best bits of advice I had from a a former manager in my grassroots environment, Burt Brown, take your coaching badges early. Why? Coach, look at me. I'm young. I've got years left in my legs. You won't regret it. And I've never told him this. I I mean, we've lost contact for quite a long while now, but I haven't regretted it. But taking my, my coaching badge early, remember the old Charles Hughes book, you know, the green book of, of long ball merchant stuff and making sure that your socks were past your knee, were up to your kneecaps and all of that. I didn't take much impact in the book, but what it taught me is that my voice was being listened to and being portrayed. So it taught me certain ways of how to utilize my voice in a coaching aspect. It taught me how to talk about the game just from a development point of view. And it also taught me to believe in myself. And I think at that time, I really needed to be, to believe in myself again, that I was worth something. Um, and on the back of that, I started, uh, uh, well, I was watching my, my eldest son play football for a Sunday league team that was well, Ridgeway Rovers again, that just, it was all about the parents. It was all about the parents wanting their son to develop in an environment and uh, he could play anywhere he want and do anything he wanted to. And I, I couldn't watch my son play for that football team. So they asked me to coach the team in the last few kind of weeks and I was coaching the team and I remember a game where uh, I brought him on. You know, I'm also a non-league manager at the time, so I'll let you know to that. I brought him on. Well, I wasn't a manager, I was a coach, so his dad brought him on and said, play right back. So he's playing behind my son who's playing right midfield. But yet he's the furthest, but he might as well have been hugging the goalpost at the other end. And I said to him, I won't mention his name just in case you never know who's listening. I said to him, you need to you need to go back and play in your rightful position. And he shouted at me that his dad said he could play where he wants. That was enough for me. So I walked away. Um, I've got to get to my game. I'm not invested in it anymore. And at that time, I said, I need to create this myself. I need to do something where I can elevate the the talent that I know and have um and help them develop along the way so i pulled my son out um i developed a team that couldn't play for five months because it was mid-season but we trained every day i loved the fact that young people were listening to my point of view in football and they wanted to develop as well um like i said i've always been kind of leadership material as such so transferring into the management circle didn't really have a effect on me I just felt I could always do it but I needed to know that I could do it again um I'm now becoming someone who coaches in after school clubs and stuff like that so I'm getting all rounded kind of development now you know so seeing talent from those that are talented to those that want to learn more and those that maybe don't have any ability but just love football they've got some ability they just love football and my journey began and I created a, a team in, in East London called Redwood Football Club. And we just became the fear of, of youth football. We'd go anywhere, um, take on anybody. Um, you will know this, Amrit, great, the great Ray Jones, um, yeah, God yeah. rest his soul, yeah. came through my environment, you know, and oh, wow. uh, he was immense, immense um, as a young footballer. And I remember the day that John O'Brien, God rest his soul again, from QPR came and said, we want him. But one of the good things is we had a conversation. I had a league to win. I had a cup final to play. And I said, no, no, we don't want to stop Ray from doing that. And this is really unusual for academy clubs. We don't want to stop Ray from doing that. We want him in our environment. Troy, let him finish the season. He can come and train still. Let him finish his season. And then he'll transfer to QPR. 
we done the double. Ray goes with all our best wishes and goes into Queen's Park Rangers environment. Um, alongside that, I've had a non-league career as well in management. I'm manager of Chesn, um, assistant uh, coach at Slough, um, assistant manager at Dover and at Boreham Wood. I've had a journey in the non-league environment as well. Took on a managerial reins at Leighton Football Club, who at Leighton Football then were the oldest football club around, non-league club around. And so I was no longer cutting my teeth. I was in the environment developing young players first and foremost uh, at Leighton Football Club. I was basically every I spent my whole life there every day. Like I do my job, which is around sports development. I go to Leighton. I'm coaching the first team. I'm manager of the under 18s. I'm I'm running the capital league side, which is the midweek side. You know, I, I sweep the changing rooms. I'm pulling pints behind the bar if they allow me. Um, you know, I'm doing literally everything at that football club, and that for me is the real value of individuals. I respect them so much for what they do, but you still got to get your training right as well. You know. Um, and yeah, I just had a, a real, real good journey. And the only reason the journey stopped was because Andros was making his professional debut at a club that I never even knew about at the time called Yeovil Town Football Club. And I didn't even know where it was in what I thought was the world, but just the country. Um, but I wanted to, that thing of investing your time into your children, that was the end of my journey. Um, and I resigned from a football club. And despite the chairman saying, Troy, you, it's mid-season, it was March, you can't. Yes, I can, because my son's now a professional footballer and he's going to make his professional debut. And if you think I'm going to be on a touchline watching Leighton versus Timbuktu, whilst I could be, you know, going down to Yeovil and watching them play, um, who was it, MK Dons, you've got to be crazy. You know, so I stopped um, and just invested in Andros' career in terms of watching him. And that's what we continue to do as a family to this very day. Wow, so that's not just the support then from when he was a youngster to when he was, you know, your, I mean, he's always going to be your little boy, but, yeah. you know, really was your little boy to to now. And you're still... That's... Yeah, I, I can't stand not seeing his football. We're not watching his games live. I can't stand it. There's a nervous tension about me anyway, watching football, um, and him playing, obviously, particularly, just because you want him to do so well every single game. But I can't stand not being in a stadium when he's playing. So, yeah, you know, we, we'll still... I'm not even going to mention the last game because it was horrendous, but we travel everywhere and anywhere um, <laughs> because that's his football. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, talk to me a little bit because I, I listened to your podcast that you did on uh, Steve's um, Spurs uh, podcast and something that really, really inspired me that I heard on there was how you came in and the reasons that you start getting involved with Kick It, Kick it Out and how you kind of progressive in there. So would you mind just sharing your journey around how that progressed? Came in as a volunteer. Um, I'm celebrating, apparently celebrating 10 years this year. So came in September uh, 2011 as a volunteer. And if you work out the 1970 World Cup, you're kind of realising how old I am, aren't you? So to to come in as a volunteer at the stage that I did, because I wanted to influence the game. I'd influence the game on the training pitch. I'd influence the game, you know, in non-league circles, in academy circles, in, you know, just the development of young people. Um, but I wanted, I felt that there was an opportunity to influence the game on a different scale. Um, I, I went to an event that Kick It Out had at the old David Beckham Centre. Uh, and Michael Emilano was there and we had a really good conversation and, you know, I'm pulling like names out of a hat at the moment, but I kind of just wanted to do more. I felt I could do more in football. So they sent out a, a thank you and then they said, oh, we've got this opportunity to volunteer and volunteering at that time. And the organisation was to fold the T-shirt, you know, all our T-shirts that you'll see. Make sure you fold the T-shirt, send them out to clubs that request them, look after the shop and all that. So that was me. You know, that was me. I'm going into a, an environment where actually I wasn't getting paid. I I had to look for sponsorship and I got sponsorship from Vodafone to be there. Um, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was a three months job. And I thought, yeah, listen, let me do this. And who knows what can happen? I put my life and soul into volunteering. I'm going to tell you this for a fact. We used to have an office in the Barbican 
which I thought was a small office whilst everyone, all the big wigs were working at Wembley. But I then realised that, no, Troy, this is the office at the Barbican, above a Pizza Express, by the way. Um, so the smell of pizza all day coming up is enough to drive you crazy. But And I was in the loft. So my permanent position was in the loft, by the way. Um, and I took pride in the resources that were up there. I took pride in the folding of the T-shirts. And I took pride in my job. And if my missus listens to this, she'll say that I've never folded a bit of clothing in my life but I I did and I loved it so when some of the staff would come up and oh can I have this t-shirt and grab it and mess up the whole pile and can I have that I would go crazy but I was invested in it and I was invested in it because I wanted them to know that there was a person here that would do anything to develop in the organization they didn't know who I was they didn't know my backstory they didn't know that I'd been invested in football since the age of however they didn't even know who my son was you know as a professional footballer so I just wanted them to treat me as Troy Townsend and, and treat me on the value of my name and the work that I did and I never forget that the, the one of the the comms guys like said to me I remember him mentioning I think Andrews was out on loan somewhere and he went your, your nephew's doing really well isn't he and he threw me, you know, I was like, nephew, like, I ain't got a nephew player. And he looked at me as if, like, what do you mean you ain't got a nephew player? I'm like, nephew, who's the... And then it clocked, and by then I'd gone too far down the line, you know, and I went, I've got to tell you something. And he went, what? I was like, like, what? And I said, it's not my nephew, it's my son. And he went, what? I said, yeah, it's my son. And he went, what? And you've worked here for two and a half months, and you've not told us that? And I went, yeah, because... I didn't want you to think that this whole focus of me saying Andros's name at the beginning, although he was only an upcoming young lad, was the reason to give me a job. And to be fair, they took that because three months of volunteering turned out into eight months. Um, so, you know, that cheap labour stuff. And yeah, it's all right because we're not having to pay him. And, and I kind of gave an ultimatum to the boss at the time and said, look, I love working here, by the way, but I can't continue to do this for five pound like expenses and, and, and five pound on the travel and it's lucky they so lucky because I was working with I don't know if you remember Earl Barrett probably before your era Amrit but definitely Steve would, would know Earl Barrett former Stoke City Man City England Oldham Aston Villa I can't remember how many clubs he had but he was working for kick it out and he always wanted to get back into coaching so I'm working with Earl on the mentoring side of things and delivering education um whilst I was still also doing my school role so I used to work hard part-time and do my school role back in East London and it all came up the day that I said to the boss it's now or never and if you ain't got no money then I'll happily go along my way the very next day Earl said got a job at Stoke City Academy now I should have been upset because I'm losing a good friend I couldn't push him out the door quick enough I couldn't see you later Earl take care it's all right thank you brother. And I remember getting a phone call from Paul Elliott saying, Troy, like the work that you've done has been amazing. He was a trustee of the organisation and I feel you should step into Earl's shoes. I remember it's, I remember this. It was a Wednesday night. I was on the training pitch with the lads. We trained on a Wednesday looking at my phone. Paul Elliott's calling. I'm telling them to pass the ball, you know, do this drill. And I thought I cannot not take this call. And I took it and it was one of the best calls I've had in recent times because not only did it give me an opportunity to work for the organization? It was proof of the journey that I wanted to have. So to volunteer, to give up as much time as I could to, to impress on them that this guy could work in this space. Um, and I, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm forever grateful because I kind of cemented what I want to do. If, if, if I could have chosen the journey and if I could have said to you the impact that I would wanted in the journey, I don't think I celebrate enough what I've done in the game and what I've done in this space around racism and discrimination, but also around mentoring and providing opportunity for young people and around like learning. Other people tell me, I'm not sure I believe in it myself, but when I can reflect and I've posted something today on my Instagram that just talked about reflecting and trying to be positive and celebrate a lot more the things that we do. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm forever grateful. And 10 years had, has felt like 25 years. And you can probably see that I've got more grey hair than last time we spoke, Steve. But yeah, uh, you know, I'm invested in this because there's not enough people, unfortunately, that invest in it in the way that, although I've seen more and more people lately, but yeah, the, the period of time that I stepped in it that were invested in that kind of level of support uh, for the game. 
th- I th- I think just from from listening to that, it's your passion, isn't it? And yeah, you know, it's just it fills me with um just the inspiration, really, and motivation to hear to hear you speak like that. Um, I just I'm, I'm just conscious of time. We're getting on a little bit. Um, just <laughs> just a quick question around. Um, and this is something that I think if I was to, from an outsider looking in, Troy, to you, um, the biggest thing that I that if someone was going to ask me, what do you think of Troy Townsend? I would say courage. And the reason I say that is because I see all these articles and, you know, you and you, you see all these comments on Twitter and all the rest of it around anything that you say, the amount of backlash you get, that's mm. what, whether it's regard to racism, equality, mm. diversity, etc. My question to you is, uh, I, I think it's quite obvious to, to why you do it, but how hard is it sometimes with that backlash and what keeps you going? Toughest question of the night. Toughest question of the night. The only way to answer, particularly the first part, is I can't describe at times how hard this journey is or speaking in this space is. Um, it's led to dark times within myself. You know, I suffer or have suffered with my mental well being. So it's led to dark spaces. It led to it's led to sleepless nights. Um, it's impacted on me emotionally as well you know because i am so invested as you've said um but it's also led me to create a massive support circle and friendship circle that is unrivaled to be totally honest so for i've I've got to start appreciating for everyone that wants that backlash because as far as they're concerned racism doesn't exist in football equality doesn't exist you know we just we just want to be want the game to be how it used to be there are much more people that actually say, thank you, Troy. Uh, and I need to realise that and home in on that a lot more than potentially I have done in the past. When I speak about dark days, I speak about the fact that I know people have tried to force me out of this industry because of the way that I speak, because I am so challenging. Um, and at that point, I've almost let them win. I, I've absolutely almost gone well maybe if that's what they want let me go but I actually then feel and I question myself to feel that I would have let so many people down if I do just walk away so I'm there asking people to stand up for what they believe in you know and to seek me out if you need me and and to continue to challenge so if I walk away what does that say about me you know so the space is unbelievably challenging Uh, I'm I'm managing the Twitter noise or the social media noise better than probably what I'd, I'd get invested in in arguments that would last for two, three days, that are like, yeah, if you've got to keep coming, I'm going to keep coming back. But now I pick and choose when I respond, and I respond in a manner that is above a lot of these abusers, like above their wavelength. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I can't say that it hasn't drained me. I'd be, it'd be wrong if I said that it hasn't drained me. It'd be wrong if I said I haven't questioned myself about how long I can go on. But like I said about that post today and that recognition of 10 years, I always have to think about the things that I've done, what I've created, the people I've supported who continually send me DMs and messages. And, and I was walked, and I haven't been out 18 months of this, this pandemic and I've been in the, the same room. You'll, you'll see that port wallpaper in, everywhere, by the way. Um, I've been out lately. I've been back in connect with players at clubs and, I was meeting a colleague at King's Cross because we were on our way to Sunderland. And as I've crossed the road, there's a cab driver looking at me like, and I'm thinking, what's it? Oh, here we go. Do you know what I mean? My first thought was a negative thought. Here we go. And the guy said, Mr. Townsend. I said, like, I said no, I don't need a cab. It's all right. Um, but he went, no, just want to say lots of respect. Thank you for everything that you do. So I stopped like, And I walked over and I went, I can't thank you enough. He went, no, don't thank me. I'm thanking you. He said, I hear, I've seen you. I've heard what you say um, and I've seen you. And on behalf of all the people that have no voice, thank you. And honestly, he then said, and your son's not too bad either, which was great. Like, (laughs) but you know what? Honestly, I, I floated after that. And I floated because 
sometimes we need to hear how we affect or how we we speak in a space that other people have not got the the license to do almost to realize what impact we're having and i think at that stage this gentleman wasn't like a youngster he you know probably my age which i'm still not revealing but he appreciated it you know and uh, it's things like that that override all the the negativity that continues to exist when i speak on any platform and steve will know this i speak my truth i don't make things up i don't like tell a lie to be able to enhance my story i spoke on the anton ferdinand documentary that came out last november december back end and i got crucified i got crucified for talking the truth and yes it affected me yes it led me to, to to shut down my platforms for two weeks yes it was a point where i actually thought yeah i'm done because if i can't talk my truth what's the point but then i also thought to myself you're getting at people because of what you're saying and you know that very old saying truth hurts that's you know it takes a long while to get me around to that position but yeah absolutely i always think that truth hurts and and I'll continue to be who I am because I can't be anybody else. Um, and hopefully that will lead to the change that I think we all want to see because I'm not asking for, I'm not asking for anything that cannot be delivered. We're asking for change. We're asking for protection. We're asking for voices to be heard. We're asking for people who have been belittled in, in this space. You know, football's supposed to be for all. Well, let's make it for all. And let's make sure that the plan behind making it for all is an effective one, not just to eliminate people from our game, but to help them, to educate them, for them to understand, you know, us free here, what we would have gone through to be where we are today and what the journeys we're going to take, you know, because I'd imagine all three of us can tell a tale where we'd all say to ourselves, it's happened to me as well, you know, and that's not fair. That's not right. You know, so eventually hopefully we'll get there but the reason i do it is because i had no no one guiding my journey when i was young i i had to make mistakes and i made a lot of mistakes and i made a lot of mistakes that got me in trouble and hopefully what i'm doing is helping guide the next generation to stand up for what they believe in but i've got children and i've got grandchildren and more so my grandchildren i don't want them to have the struggles that i've had growing up because if they have, then I've, I've used that word again. I have failed, and the many people that are in this space at the moment would have failed if they have those continued battles and challenges. Um, and I wouldn't want to see them go through what I've gone through. So why would I see anyone's children and children's children do the same? Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, I just love listening to you, to be honest. I mean, I've let I've let <laughs> I've let Amrit lead because I'm I'm very happy to spend an hour, hour twenty, hour and a half, however long you're prepared to give. I'm I'm prepared to listen. I you know everything you say always resonates. It's always a powerful message, and it's always a message that I'm happy to hear and that I want to hear. Um, you know, and I think. A lot of what you say um, empowers people and, you know, gives people that energy and that enthusiasm to, to want to go on and to make to make a change and, and to, you know, to, to to make a difference, I think, you know, and you know what, Steve, as as that's, said, why, the long, that's the why long, that, that's why I said to you, sorry to cut across you, Steve, that's fine. But that's why I said to you, let's do it a little bit earlier. Because I knew there's no way we're going to complete this in an hour. There's no way we're going to have a conversation of this sort. And at eight, eight o'clock, you're going to say to me, thanks, Troy. See you later. Bye-bye. Because I'm going to say to you, no, I've got more to say. So you make sure you keep recording. You know what I mean? We're not even um, halfway through, Troy. We're not halfway through. We've got lots <laughs> more to ask you. <laughs> but no, it's honestly like things like this is the reason I do what I do. It's just things like this, you know, it, it, it helps because obviously I don't have to convince you guys, do I? Do you know what I mean? You, you you understand it, you live it in the same breath that I do. But 
whenever you put this out and whoever it impacts on or who reflects on it is that's where we can't measure how much we do because I don't know how many people will see it but if words resonate like you've just said there Steve we've influenced another group of people and another group of people how do you measure that I can't measure it you can't measure it but I'm grateful to be able to have the platform and, and talk my truth um, to be able to influence and support people who, who may need that along the way Wow. Um, I can't stop smiling, Troy. Um, <laughs> all right, let's. Uh, I'm just gonna. I just want to touch upon Black History Month for a little bit, if that's all right with you. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're we're kind of coming to to the end of October, so the end of Black History Month for the allocated month, and I think a real key message that I've got out of of celebrating this event over the last few years, or well, really being conscious about it, is that actually Black History Month should be every month and black history is all our history i want to ask you what does black history month mean to you specifically can i be rude go for it absolutely nothing absolutely nothing and for the reasons you've just mentioned there um listen i've been a school teacher in this space and and been i'm a sports teacher so i've been a PE teacher and had to get children from class, etc., and realise that the topic of black history is not even on the agenda. Uh, projects around black history, nah, not thought of. So I remember taking a class and saying, we're not going out today. What, sir? Oh, we're not going out. What do you mean we're not going? No, nah, sir, don't mess about. So no, we're not going out. We're going to learn about black sports people. So for an hour, we had to do research and then present uh, in the second lesson, which would have been a week later, who they'd researched and who they wanted to align themselves to in regards to black sports people. It was important then. Since I've worked in this, I've got to be honest here, I'm sorry. Since I've worked in this space, I think it's utilised for a totally different purpose. And I don't like the purpose it's utilised, to be totally honest. I'm not saying everyone, so last year let's be honest i thought that was the most significant black history month that we would ever have why george floyd had been murdered black history black um lives matter became prominent in our sport so i'm only talking about football here prominent in our sport the messaging the 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 understanding and and the also the negativity became prominent came a hot topic of conversation my Black History Month last month, last year, was the wildest Black History Month I've ever had. I think I did and contributed to something every single day. And I felt I had to. I felt it was important. Although, like I said, for me, Black History don't really mean much because you tell me that you're creating stories around Black History for the whole year, then let's talk. But I felt it was important. I'd measured last year at its height against this year and I've now seen that, oh, where are, where are, where is everyone? Where are people again? Why is, what is the significance of black history to them? Is it going to end at the end of the, what's the end of the month, at the weekend? Are we going to continue stories? There's people that I didn't hear from in a year. There's an organisation that booked me last April that said, yeah, we'd love to do something again in October. And I said, why October? Why can't we do it in June, July? What? Why is your fascination around Dr. Well, it's Black History Month, isn't it? So why can you not, if you want your, your, your employees to understand more, reflect more and contribute more, why are you going to wait till October? So for me, I, listen, I'm not going to say it has no significance whatsoever because that would be absolutely disrespectful. But I talk to young academy players who say to me, and I'm going to tell, I'm going to say this. What did you learn about black history when you were in school? Learn about lynching. We learned about the KKK. We learned about slavery. Someone might throw in the odd Rosa Parks, um, but everything was negative. And there'll be many that will say, to be fair, not much. And so our academic system has let down our young people for them to understand and grow with knowledge into topics of conversation, then move out of celebrating black history to talking about the negativity and the way black and brown people are received in football on a mass 
level because it's a topic of conversation they've never had to broach before or they're never even talking about celebrating the iconic figures that we do because in their school or their uh, academic environment they didn't have to talking about black history should not be an uncomfortable conversation for an 18 year old a 17 year old a 16 year old if their school life has been a positive one in regards to learning should not be an, uh, 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 an uncomfortable I went to a club and I won't name the club two weeks ago where 70 percent of the boys in that room were uncomfortable with the conversation around racism and discrimination to the point where they would not open their mouths for fear fear by the way so for me yes let's never lose the significance of black history month let's or let the people that maybe see it as a one month thing really you know devise a plan for 30 days or whatever else but for me if i'm going to gauge this black history month against last one it proves to me why we need to talk you know november the 1st onwards rather than just october the 1st to the end of october would you i mean would you would you see it as um a catalyst though i mean like i i totally agree that you know the focus and this is something like we you know we've I spoke to Amrit about separately, but it shouldn't just be a focus within a month. And and there's there's, there's I think there's an advert at the moment. Uh, I can't remember if it's on BBC or where it is, but there's an advert at the moment asking why the hell have they chosen October for Black History Month when Black people don't like the cold? And it would be nice if it had been in, in if it had been in June and 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 whatever. So um so you know th there's that side of things. And but but the, at the same time now. As far as I'm aware, um, in Wales, they've now introduced, I don't know why Wales specifically, but in, in Wales, they've introduced black history onto the school curriculum and it will be taught on the school curriculum. Now, I don't know the nature of it. And I, as again, you'd like to hope that there's more um, of a celebration of, of, you know, black achievement within that and, you know, black people that have, have, have contributed to, uh, you know, significant events within history and, and manu you know, making things and, and, you know, like we like we talk about, you know, other uh, other uh, people. So you'd like to think that that's the folk going to be the part of the focus rather than, as you say, talking more about uh, slavery and, and, and various negative um, aspects within, you know, within um, that period. Um, so, but that is something that two years ago wasn't on the agenda, you know. So, that for me, I think that there needs to there has to be a starting point, and are uh, you know, uh, can we use the, this the you know this continued focus on like Black History Month to to broaden it out, as you say, so that it's not a month, so then more people start to talk about it more um for a, over a longer period of time and to push for a change to the school system and how you know how they they teach and talk about black culture and and, and stuff to to then as you say so then it then becomes it's not a, a speciality it's not you know something that just happens like you know and we, we have to make a big deal out of it because actually it's it's as Amber said it's just our, generic, it's part yeah. of our culture yeah Mm, exactly. Like, listen, I, I would never knock anyone that wants to create a different space than what it has, has been in the past. And, and having a more celebratory black history in our curriculum is a massive turn than what it has been. Um, you know, not only black history, we've got Islamophobia month next month. You know, and, and I'm no doubt that there'll be people crawling out the woodwork and celebrating uh during that period of time or having recognition during that period of time that have never spoken in this space before you know let's join them let, let let's let's create a journey now where you know maybe we eliminate i don't know maybe maybe me i might be controversial i may have people that look like me say what are you talking about troy but you know i unfortunately i work in an industry where black and brown people do not we're celebrated in one aspect because we're the entertainers but we're not celebrated in other aspects and there's more to, to black and brown people in football 
than just being a footballer, you know, and we, we're not celebrated at the highest level of the games because we can't impregnate the highest level of the game. We're not in leadership roles. We're not in. So for me, there's a whole point here of not just being able to celebrate, but also recognising the talent that we have within our own pathways, you know, that, that could be, I don't know, you get me to a point, Steve, where I don't want to go too radical because I'll tear up the whole program and we'll start doing something that maybe won't be usable on, on YouTube platforms or whatever else. But <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I just think there's a, there's a, there's a bigger and better solution to what is being delivered at the moment in our academic system. Absolutely. But also around our other environments as well. I don't want to be boxed into a month. I don't want the celebration of our people to be boxed into a month. I just think football, my space, our space, football utilises those months and then pays less significance to them in the preceding and, and the, the other 11 months. So, yes, the academic system is important to, and that story about Wales is massively important. I'm hearing that, you know, Marcus Rashford will be on the, the GCSE curriculum as well, um, somewhere along the line in, 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 in this country. So, you know, we'll take small wins. But there needs to be a, a much bigger picture to to kind of how we continue to push people who are still core of underrepresented people within our sport. Before Amrit jumps in, so I think um, at that, do you, one of the things that I wanted to recognise or to raise is the, um, you know, just as in, in terms of developing that space, I think is the importance of allies. So, as you say, I think like, you know, after the George Floyd um, incident and, and, and that time um, and, and all the outcry and everything, and, and there was a lot of a lot more noise being made at that time. And it felt like there was we were going to we were we were making more headway. Um, and I think in terms of incidents that are raised now, you do hear and you do see more people that will speak up and speak out against it um, now. And I, so my, my point is that how how important is it to have um, allies within, you know, within within this space and within raising, you know, raising these issues? So now, for example, if we if we look at just specifically at football, you know, Gareth Southgate, for example, is proving to be a, a huge ally, I think, in terms of trying to raise awareness and talk against racism and, and people being better and recognizing not only, you know, where, you know, as a, as a nation, we're going, oh, you know, bloody Hungarians and bloody Eastern Europeans and Romanian, they're so, you know, it's racism over there and we know it and, you know, but he says, right, no, there, there is, but actually let's not look inwards before we look outwards. You know, we, we have to recognise that we have our own issues that we still need to deal with and we need to get on top of that before we start, you know, throwing stones at other other people. So yeah, how important do you think is that? Steve, this is fundamentally the things that I get myself in trouble for because <laughs> I will talk about You can tell me stuff. if I'm asking the wrong questions. Obviously. No, no, no. no <laughs> listen, believe you me, I will talk about uh, the racism and discrimination in this country which allows me to then have a view on what's happening out in Hungary, because I just don't think it's a Hungarian problem. Do you know what I mean? I know I'm well aware of the issues that we have in our country and I will raise my head above and speak up about them. So, you know, on a, on a reputable radio show the other day, you probably know it, but again, I'm speaking up about the Hungarians, but also saying, but hold on a minute, let's not get on our high horse. And the co-presenter's like, what are you talking about? Let's not conflate the issues. And uh, So I'm just saying, well, hold on a minute. You're not close enough to the issue to know that we still fundamentally have problems in our own country. I'm going to say that Gareth Southgate is showing excellence in leadership. I'm not going to call him an ally. He's showing excellence in leadership. How I would expect any leader to perform that has that kind of level of importance in this space doesn't shy away from a conversation you know is prepared to talk on behalf of his group of people because he understands 
who's who he is, who he's marshalling, who he's leading in into into battle almost, if we're going to use those kind of terms. I don't see enough leaders like a Gareth Southgate, champions like a Gareth Southgate, to to lord many other people in this space. We have them. And if I'll say this and people will have a go at me, maybe at lower levels, I think we all champion in, in different spaces now. Do you know what I mean? We all show leadership within our own environment. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the term ally and is being an ally enough? Is saying, oh, I'm not homophobic. Is that enough? Or is actually stepping out of your circle and going into environments where many people say, what's he doing there? Do you know what I mean? What, 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 what's he doing? It's not part. That, for me, is showing that is a champion. That is someone who's prepared to go into a space that many are uncomfortable, that is not part of his community circle as such, based on the colour of his skin or other particular characteristics, and who's prepared to have conversations with people to understand their journeys. And Gareth Southgate nails that time and time again. And he nails it because he understands his responsibility in this space. And by the way, a comment from Gareth Southgate on racism will go much further than a comment on me by me. But I've got lived experiences. Do you know what I mean? So actually, he's, he's almost endorsing my lived experiences. But he's, because of his leadership role, he will be heard more than what my voice will. will. So there's many people that are discussing at the moment the term ally and allyship. And I think it's important that we do have an open conversation about it. And, and leaning towards leadership, leaning towards champions, leaning towards, you know, just how do you describe what an ally is? I can describe a champion. I can describe a leader. You know, so uh, we need more leaders. We need more people that can affect the environment. We need more people that are just not going to talk or wear a badge or, 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 or offer a solution. We need the leaders that can action change. That's how we'll create this space. And I don't know, in, in five years' time, I'm not sure I'll be around five years' time. I'm just going to say five years' time because Amrit is a lot longer than me. You know, you won't have to host these these sessions anymore. You know, we're talking about other things and, and I'm not saying you won't have, but you know what I mean? You're driving a different conversation because you've seen and you've reflected on the change that has happened in the industry for five years. And that's born from the people that have been affected but from also the champions who who can affect the change that we'd like to see. Absolutely, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this um, just so it's on record. Um, I think that, and this is a message more so to the younger generation. And I think that anyone listening that's from the younger generation will agree with me um, that we are incredibly lucky to be in the position we're in, and that is all thanks to people like yourself, Troy, and people like Steve um, and I'll say it and I'll put it on record that I would quite honestly say that if it wasn't for people like you I wouldn't be in the role that I'm in I wouldn't be involved in football I wouldn't have the courage enough to to overcome those barriers so from my eyes looking out you know for both of you but I'll go one step above and I'll say heroes for me um, and I hope that resonates with anyone else that's listening with a young perspective I just want to move on to the future of football <laughs> the final final part we're getting there Troy we are getting there <laughs> um, <laughs> um, right tell me you well we use the five years or whatever ten years slowly moving out of the game but you know developing and moving on and, and time's gone on what do you hope to see when you walk across your local grassroots pitch i'd have to find it first i don't know where it is anymore but yeah um remember i said the last question was hard i think this question is hard as well i think i spent far too long on the last question to, to really give a great answer to this one if i was to walk across my local grassroots pitch a pitch that I'd been a part of and hopefully created a future for many. I just want to see fairness. I honestly, and fairness from someone who may be officiating, fairness from the two teams on the football field or the teams as I walk through, parents, 
guardians, loved ones. I'd love to walk through an environment and just see fairness. Grassroots football should be a place of happiness, should be a place of joy, uh, should be a place where you're a little bit more free. You're, you're kind of don't have those restrictions placed on you that you do if you go into an academy environment and obviously in the professional game. You do in a sense because of the nature of, of the game of football that we love and enjoy so much. But I don't think it has to have the intensity from the outside of the football field, the inside of the football field that it does at the moment. Um, I want anyone to be able to walk on a pitch and feel like they can be themselves and excel and not be judged. And I would say that whether that was a grassroots pitch or whether that was a professional pitch, by the way. Um, you know, we need to create this, not create, we need to continue to laud what happens at grassroots, the positivity, um, because it's the making of the future of the game. It's as simple as that. Those players that are playing in the Premier League, the Football League, the non-league circles, they haven't just magically come out of somewhere and landed and put on a kit and are playing there. They're born from the various the, the, the avenues that we're discussing here today. You know, they're created in those spaces by good people that allow them to flourish. But we still hear stories of people who have negative experiences and no longer want to participate in our game. The stories of the officiating at the moment, the referees who feel unprotected. And so we haven't got as many referees as what we should have. You know, because they don't feel protected and they feel that they're a target for people's anger. That's not correct. We still have very loud, angry parents who dominate a fixture and maybe not just dominate their own child, but dominate people around them for the ferocity of their voice and the way they talk on the touchline. I'm not saying that, you know, that they can't encourage and I'm not saying that they shouldn't be able to, you know, egg on their child. But I've heard some when I was involved, some pretty horrendous stuff just through the 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 the, the loudness of voices and how it must make a young person feel frightened. You know, my childhood ended ages ago, but some of the noises I hear now, I'm wondering why I didn't freeze on a football pitch. Do you know what I mean? So Fairness is is a nice way to kind of round it up as such, you know. And like I said, I think I think more onus needs to put on grass mean put on grassroots. Um, and that's not to disrespect to any of the work that goes on, by the way. But like I said, it's the first point of a stepping stone for the future. So we have to respect it and and provide it with as as much. Listen, money is a, a a very difficult thing, but as much resource to make sure that the game can continue to flourish and continue to create that England team that played in the Euros that had everyone on the crest of a wave thinking that we could win finally after decades. You know, when you see the pictures of those young players when they were younger, smiling, laughing, enjoying, connecting, playing against, playing for, that's, what, that's the images we want to continue to create. Um, unfortunately, obviously, with the work that I do, I hear the other side. And, you know, when you play grassroots, effectively, you're a volunteer. When you referee at grassroots, yeah, you get a little bit of money, but you're a volunteer. The volunteers that work in the environment that connect all the dots and bring all the people together. You should never have to experience anything that some of the stuff that I read, unfortunately. So a fairer uh, footballing community. A football community that respects each other no matter role they have whatever role they have to play in the environment um and the, the rewards so that the rewards of, of knowing that people are giving up their time giving up their time to support the journeys of many um sorry i'm it's a long walk i'm taking you on by the way no, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um how big is park <laughs> <laughs> i've done I've, I've come back and gone round again but yeah sorry it's, it's a long one but you know, there's not one simple answer, is there, to, to 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 knowing what you'd like to see. And whilst I always applaud those questions, I have to give them the importance that they are um, and try and make my, my responses as important to what the question is. Absolutely. Um, right. I've still got my notepad open and I have had <laughs> the whole time. 
So uh, this is a this is a real question for for youngsters like Steve and I. Um, what advice would you give to the younger generation or people that are just coming through the game that want a career in the game potentially as referees, coaches? So I appreciate it might be a bit of a, a rounded answer, but what what advice would you give to people like that? I mean, you just made me feel really old. Do you know that? Have I? I know that. Yeah, because you're talking about the youngsters and and like me and Steve and and all that kind of stuff. So I, yeah. Do you know what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Apply yourself. Find someone that can support you. So no matter what environment you're in, you know, whether it's a mentor, if you class them as a mentor, whether you can be in networking events, whatever, find someone who can support your pathway your journey and i'm not just talking about your your parents and your you know your loved ones who will always do that anyway hopefully but i'm talking about people that will also benefit you as you go through the journey of sport in whatever avenue i i I said to you before the one thing that i i believe that i've always missed is someone guiding my journey i had mac and then when mac was no more there was no one to replace mac and so I had to find out things by myself. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you're a young person now, I think there are more opportunities. I think there are more people willing to help and support than what there ever was before. You know, there was none of this during my period of time because video calling wasn't a thing. Um, but the support systems that I've managed to connect with or that are connected with young people now are absolutely amazing. And a lot of that support is free, you know, free. And I don't mean three pound, I mean free, you know, and, and that, you know, that would never have happened before. So always reach out to good organisations, good people if you need that guidance. You know, uh, everyone seems to be OK when things are good and struggle when things are bad. So don't just do it when the going's good. You know, don't just sorry, don't ignore it when the going's good. Like, in matter of fact, value it more when the going's good. So that actually your lows might not be as low as what some of mine have been or some of ours have been in the past, you know. Um, but like I said, there's so many, so many good people in, in in our sport to help you on that journey. I love it. And I think this is a perfect one to to round it off on. And this is probably the biggest question. So I think I might get a, a bit of a dirty look for this one because of the amount of big ones that I've thrown at you already. But what do you want your legacy to be in the game? (laughs) My legacy will be what it will be. If you're honest, if you do things with honesty, if you create relationships with honesty, if you work with good intentions, You're not in control of your legacy because your legacy will be defined by who you are. And there's. And your legacy will mean so many different things to so many different people. So, you know, today you're both going to have a slightly different opinion of me. Your take or sorry, your takeaways will be slightly different. They'll be similar, but slightly different. Do you know what I mean? So if. I don't, I don't care. Ah, I hate your question because I don't care about legacies. I don't, you know, the, I don't want to be defined by that. But, you know, when you're gone, no, you're not in control of that. And people will talk about you in this space positively or negatively. And they'll talk about your influence and what you did and, and, and the way that you helped them. No, we're not in control of that. So I could devise a legacy here now. And if it don't matches it, the only one that's going to get who's going to be disappointed is me. Uh, So I'm not going to define a legacy. I'm just going to say. When I walk away from here, whenever that may be, and that may be sooner rather than later, um, I just hope that. People have appreciate what I've tried to do in this space and what I've tried to. I think we've got too many selfish people in football. I say I've said it. Maybe I shouldn't have done, but I've said it. I think there's too many selfish people in football that are only worried about their own agenda. And I've got to be honest, I'd give I'd give anything to see a whole new breed of people come through the environment and infiltrate football from the highest level right down. Because I think that's what it needs as well. So 
if I can open a door, the key to that door is my legacy. The key to that door. And if people then rush through, um, the door can remain open forever. I love it. Steve, have you got anything to add? No, not really. I think um, we might see if we can squeeze out another hour or two through Troy. But <laughs> um, no, honestly, you know, it's been a, a wonderful nit nine on two hours, um, as I said already. And I, 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 yeah, I think, you know, your message is, is good. Um, so no, I have nothing beyond that that I'd like to add. <laughs> Right, let's uh let's wrap it up there. Um Troy, it's been an absolute honour to host you on this. Um it's been an hour and fifty odd minute ish of absolute pure motivation and inspiration. And yeah, I don't know, I just feel so boosted right now after listening to to you speak. Um and I'm sure Steve Steve will have the same opinion. Um but yeah, hopefully we haven't scared you off too much. Um <laughs> Don't worry, not everyone in Bedfordshire talks as much as me and Steve do. Um, <laughs> maybe Steve, but definitely not me. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Troy. Thank you so much. Pleasure has been mine. Really appreciate it and enjoyed it thoroughly. Brilliant. Um, and we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>